Okay, let's go live. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. We're going to give everyone just a minute to, for the Zoom world to let everyone in, and then we'll kick off, officially kick off with our um, wonderful guest, Dr. Jacqueline Duge. I'm so delighted that you're here. And uh, Dr. Jackie, I know that I haven't, I haven't, I didn't mention this in our prep call th this morning. We've received so many messages from people who are super excited to be here with you. So um, thank you for being here because we we love to be able to to share wonderful messages with the world. And I know that we're all going to learn a lot from you. So excellent, excellent, excellent. So awesome. Well, let's dive in with uh, looks like we have a great group with us already, and I'm sure others will be popping in shortly. So. Hello, happy Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. For those of you who are uh, maybe new to, to our community, Hummingbird Hour is our monthly conversation series uh, that amplifies the voices of the unheard. And uh, today um, we are with, we'll be, we're, we're with Doc, Dr. Jacqueline Juge, who is a, an author um, and a change maker and a, and a pediatrician and so much, so much we're going to learn from Dr. Jackie. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, right now, we're focused on Hummingbird Hour um, and inviting other authors to the to the stage. I, my book, my first book ever, comes out next spring, um, and I wanted to amplify other authors as we track towards that that release. So, um, so excited for another wonderful conversation on Hummingbird Hour today, um, and thank you all for being with us. So, um, whether you're with us live or joining um, and watching us later, um, if you, uh, we we certainly want to make sure that this is an opportunity to build community. So we encourage you to introduce yourselves in the chat, share where you're zooming in from, share your LinkedIn, share what you do, um, whatever you'd like to share, but please connect with each other and use the chat as another way to engage in today's conversation. So just a few um, highlights before we dive in. So let's um, highlight that this month is National Black Business Month. So um, you know, please, uh, if you uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, amplify a black business owner that you may happen to know, share about them on your social media channels and encourage people to check out their business or shop local black businesses in your area. Um, let's uh, continue to support each other as we work to, to make the world a better place and more inclusive for everyone. I also want to highlight Hummingbird Speaks. Hummingbird Speaks is our speakers bureau um, at Hummingbird Humanity. So we we launched this um, because uh, when I worked in house as a head of diversity and inclusion, um, we were always looking for speakers, and the people that we were always coming up with were amazing humans like Brene Brown and Michelle Obama. And I would love to be able to afford those those speakers, but the reality is most of us don't have those budgets in house. So we have a wonderful community of speakers that are professional speakers that share their personal stories and have an understanding of how companies can make their environments more diverse, equitable, and inclusive um, at a, a price point that is more budget appropriate for our corporate environment. So reach out if we can help you find a speaker for your next event. Um, and uh, this this uh, slide here uh, highlights several of our queer speakers, uh, Elizabeth, JD, and Mark, Brittany, and Ben. I remembered all their names. They're all fantastic humans who are, we're just delighted are part of our Speakers Bureau. And Next month uh, for Hummingbird Hour, I'm delighted that Mark Travis Rivera is going to be joining us to talk about his book, Drafts, an Imperfect Collection of Writing. Mark is also a member of the Hummingbird Humanity team, so um, please uh, please join us next month when we will learn uh, from Mark, who is a, a queer person of color and, uh, and also identifies as a person with a disability. So join us next month. But today we're with... Dr. Jacqueline Duge, who wrote um, and recently wrote and, and published the book, Love, Learning to Love All of Me. Um, and so I can't wait to talk about the story and Dr. Jackie, how you're changing the world. So I'm going to come back to you in just a moment and uh, invite you to share a few words. But let me just tell you all a little bit about Dr. Jackie. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Duge is a pediatrician, writer, and speaker. She's a child health expert on the issues of the impact of racism on children's health and helping parents talk about talk to children about race and racism. She's been featured on Today, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, and NPR. 
In addition, she's the co-author of the American Academy of Pediatrics Policy Statement, The Impact of Racism on Child and Adolescent Health. When she's not writing, she hosts What is Black, a parenting podcast that addresses, addresses issues important to raising healthy and thriving Black children and teens. Learning to Love All of Me is her first middle grade novel, book that focuses on racial identity, self-acceptance, and family, and it's available on Amazon. So um, Dr. Jackie, I'm so delighted you're here. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for the um, wonderful opportunity to, uh, to talk with you and to just, just be in community. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and I, um, I have so many places I want to start. I, can you just, uh, let's start with like, how did you get into this? So, you know, when I, when I think about uh, the journey that I took, like I didn't expect to follow my, find my way to be a, a, hopefully people will think of me as a change maker, someone who is trying to make the world a better place and more inclusive for everyone. I always, you know, as a gay man and a person with a disability, I always knew that I didn't fit, but I didn't know that I was going to be part of this, this work and this conversation to, 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 to drive change. How did you find your way into this? Oh, okay. So we talked a little bit um, earlier. I just think it's just something that happens. I think um, you're either a person who wants to make a difference or someone who will just, just let things happen, right? And, and, I, and I think that's, that's probably maybe too simplistic, right? Because you, in many instances, you have to be in a place where you can make the change or see that you can make the change. And that's what I had, right? I had, you know, parents that were supportive, um, had parents who affirmed my, my identity. Um, and then also to having other people along the way that also said, you know what, okay, Jackie's different, but we can, we can get behind her and support her, right? Um, I mean, of course, like other people, I mean, if you're, if you are different, right? What is racial? I mean, all the all all these intersectional intersections of identity of how you how you show up, right? The kid wearing glasses, wearing pigtails, you know, kind of like a nerdy kind of kid, you know. That's one that's one identity, right? And then these other identities. So I think having having people that continue to support you, even though you may be going through hard times, also made it also where was helpful. And I think the other thing that was very helpful is, you know, as, as I got older, was knowing that, you know what, this is, this is who I am, right? I do want to, I do want to help make change. And I have, in many instances, people I could talk to that would support that change so that we can make, you know, start small and then kind of evolve. So I think all of those factors. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I, I really appreciate you sharing just some hints of your story. And I know we're going to learn a little, a little bit more about your story as we go through our conversation of, you know, there are so many of us that have had those moments of feeling like an outsider or feel like we're different or feel like we're not included. And but I think that is one of those, um, for almost all of us, it's a universal experience as humans. And it's one of those ways that we can also connect with each other and say, like, while my experience is, is very different than your lived experience, uh, we can both connect with that feeling of like, there were moments where I felt like I wasn't part of whatever was happening and it didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so is that? I'm, let's let's talk about the book first, because um, I'm gonna. I, I like. I want to talk about the podcast. I want to talk about the book. Um, and actually, I actually should share just for um, you know that something that is coming up for me that I want to. I'm going to be thinking about as we're having this conversation is um, I don't have any children in my life yet. Someday I hope that I will. Um, but uh, I have uh my goddaughter and godson are both um hispanic um i have um a, a group of what we call them surrogate nieces and nephews uh there are eight of them i think all together um and two of them are um black children maya and jay are black children um i have another group of kids um that are um my friends phil and sean are parents too and two of them are biracial um and so like i'm thinking and i i, I still i was in a moment i remember when i was uh staying with Sean and Phil once and uh one of their children came home and said um a little girl who was white told him that he couldn't be friends she couldn't be friends with him anymore because his skin was dark 
And I, that I just, I happened to be there and I heard that and it broke my heart. Um, I'm guessing those are the, are, are, are there, are there, I'm sure there are lots of stories like that, that I just haven't been exposed to that are, there, are those the types of stories that inspired you to write this book or what was the, what was behind the, the, you know, your passion for, for this message? I mean, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I think I think definitely lived experience, right, informed um, writing the book, and then also this idea of writing a story that I wish I had when I was younger. Mm. So growing up, you know, I grew up in the '70s and '80s, and you think about like um, the Loving decision, right? So the Supreme Court decision that outlawed um, um, interracial. No, outlawed the laws that prohibited interracial um, relationships, right, or marriages, you know, so, you know, made some progress in other, other areas as well. So just kind of growing up in the 70s and 80s, there, there weren't a lot of um, people that look like me, right? I knew I grew up, I knew growing up, I was identified as Black, um, but for many kids, um, I, I had sort of, they thought I was white. Right, so this idea of, you know, you look different, you know, quote unquote stereotypical features of, you know, being close or proximity to whiteness as opposed to being identified as black. And then trying to trying to prove who I was, right, to to friends and or people who who I wanted them to see me for who I am, right? Even though they didn't have an understanding. But again, as, as you grow older, you start to realize that this idea of how we see other people, right, is informed by society, right? And in many instances, in regards to race, um, structural racism, right, structural racism, white supremacy, right, these, these constructs, they're not even constructs, these ideas of how people should be and in boxes um, and how phenotypically, how someone is supposed to look, right, to identify them as a certain as a certain way, right? So this idea, and then also the work that I'm doing as a pediatrician and being a mom of two black sons, you know, all these things, again, all these things sort of layer and create a scaffolding for how do you want to make a difference? How do you want to um, raise your children? Um, and also hopefully that you make the world a safer place, because right? I, you know, I, I can't say that I have the same experiences that my brother had, right? So my brother very dark is, has a darker skin complexion and he's a male, right? He had, he had the, he had the issues with um, growing up being a black male, right? And I had my experiences and then I now have two black sons who don't, you know, who don't look exactly like me in terms of skin complexion, right? So they're going to be, they're going to be targets, right? So understanding all these things and this idea of like, how do you, how do you navigate, how do you help your kids navigate this? How do you help other kids and families navigate these issues? And I also like to write, right? So again, the scaffolding and then trying to figure out, right, how do you, how do, can you make a difference, but it not necessarily always be so heavy, so, you know, yeah, so miserable, right? So, but books can provide opportunities where we can have open conversations, right? Or open up the conversations about things that we may not ordinarily want to talk about, right? Or we shy away from talking about. And I knew I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to write for children. Um, so this idea of like, okay, what story do you start with in writing a book? And, and I'm going to misquote, but I think it's a quote from Maya Angelou, or to, I may, actually maybe Toni Morrison, right? writing the story that you that you want to read or that you wish that you could read, right? So and that's sort of like the context for writing the book, um, writing a story about a young girl who, um, who identifies as Black, but struggles a little bit because not everyone always thinks that she looks Black, right? Um, and then based on just the different complexions um, of her parents versus her, and then, you know, being a middle school student, right, this is really an interesting time, right, when you start to kind of understand who you are, right, you're starting to, starting to really be owning who, you're, who you want to be, right, and you're comparing yourself to other people. So that was, so that was the crux of the, the context for the book and the source material for the book, and then just trying to write the story in a way that wasn't too heavy, but does explore those ideas of racial identity, family, um, and um, racism as well.
on, you know, on that, the last point you just made there, I think is, is an ongoing like challenge in the work that I get to do with, with companies when I'm, you know, we're trying to tackle systemic oppression and racism and white supremacy and company cultures. And how do we do it in a way that's, that's accessible and that we can move the conversation forward without um, minimizing the reality of those impacts. And so it sounds like you were, you were trying to find that dance and in, in as you were writing this book. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like, I mean, to talk about it now, I, I, I think in writing the book, right, those weren't those things that were going through my head, right? I knew that I wanted to write this story, you know, based on some personal experiences, right? Some, some lived experiences, but at the same time, knowing that, you know, this character is not me, but what would I, what would if I, what would I, I like the experience to have been, right? Um, when I was younger and potentially what it could be for other kids um, growing up. And then also again, you know, this, I, these identities of being also a parent and a pediatrician and understanding that, you know, I talk about books all the time because they can be opportunities for parents um, to have conversations with kids or kids to kind of think about, oh, you know, I've gone through that experience. It might not be the same thing, but something I can kind of like relate to and it makes me feel okay, okay with myself, right? You know, it's okay that I question who I am. It's okay, it's okay to be different. Um, but how do we work through this, right? How can, how can I find my group that will support me and vice versa, right? So it's, it's kind of all those, all those things, you know, growing up is, growing up is hard, but it also can be, you know, fun, right? You think about like, okay, I had some really good times when I was little, even though there are these struggles that sometimes, unfortunately, sort of kind of outweigh some of the good memories, but that's like, you know, that's, that's, I think, nature, unfortunately, we kind of tend to think about the things that happen bad to us and, and not necessarily always realize the good, right? And being present with um, all the things that made us, those experiences that make us who we are and how we can take advantage of those experiences. And like you said, try to make something, make something better and, you know, better. Mm. So I'm, I'm curious here. Well, so I'm curious, is the, is the book based on your personal story or is it inspired by your story? I'm sure that this is- I would I would say it's inspired by my personal story. Um, and then again, you know, get to play, right? I mean, like, you know, you've written, you know, you've written a book um, and what, you know, even if it's, I think nonfiction, right? Hopefully you get a chance to kind of like, you know what, you know, I think to even take on the the chore, all right, or the, or, you know, to write. Sometimes it does feel like, did feel like a chore to it write. It does feel like a chore sometimes. <laughs> I'm excited to like, oh, you know, I have all these ideas, these characters are talking to me um these I you know and it's exciting but then you have to like organize it you know so that's the chore part but but I'm thinking like you it's like you have to have like a nugget of something right to start with I think to be able to then build this world mm -hmm. um so so I was like okay I'm going to steal from some of my personal experiences because <laughs> it's just easy right it's kind of convenient it's like and then add and then layer and, and make it make it hopefully like a really fun and engaging story yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm curious. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, that you talk about books a lot. Are are you having as a pediatrician? If you're, you know, are, I, I don't know if you're still doing direct patient care, but are you having these conversations with parents? Are they trying to figure out how to have these conversations with their kids about racial identity? Is that is that an expansion of your work as a pediatrician? Yeah, and it's and it's also yeah, yes. I would I would say yes, um, but also other things as well. Like I mean it it's come up in conversations, not necessarily about identity, but it's related to identity, like, you know, parents having their kids go through puberty. You know, I've had a few parents ask, like, can you give me recommendations about books that have diverse characters, right? And this idea of how, how we talk about puberty, how we talk about um, growing up, you know, um, sexual orientation, you know, so those come into play, right? And having the, having the tools that reflect the experiences that kids have, makes a difference for parents and even for the kids who want to learn more right or or trying to find a way to learn more but you have to have some way to bridge that conversation for parents that want to have something that represents their children and vice versa kids can learn so yes yeah do you do you what, what's your what's your take on how many resources exist out there for for children to have and parents to have these conversations because my my sense is when i'm in corporate environments uh working with adults uh and uh, so many times they're like 
my kids are bringing up these questions and having these conversations and I don't have the resources or tools uh, to be able to uh, to have to, to find ways to bridge that gap and educate themselves as well as have those conversations with kids. Um, so have you found a collection of tools and resources that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think there can be more. I mean, I think in terms of um, for younger kids, some really good resources for um, topics that talk about race or identity. There's the Brown Bookshelf. Um, we Need Diverse Books have um, a basically, they sort of categorize a catalog. So you can, based on different ideas of identity, you can find um, also to, um, like Sesame Street, PBS Kids, for even smaller, for smaller children have resources. Um, Reach Out and Read um, has a diversity. Um, so Reach Out and Read is a program that works to try to place books um, to young children zero to five through pediatricians offices or healthcare providers offices. So there, there are lots of um, resources, but there definitely could be more. Sure, sure. Yeah, and um, you've you've mentioned a couple that I love, like Sesame Street, um, and that I have I've referred to a few that I didn't know, so I look forward to exploring. The the, the other one that I I often mention is um, Mattel, and particularly Barbie uh, has mm -hmm. done some really great video content and messages, um, and certainly uh, with their their um, Mattel's commitment to producing products that are in embracing diversity um, is another great organization to follow and and does try to produce content for kids as well. So what, um, you know, one thing I didn't think about um, it, sharing earlier, so I mentioned these wonderful humans that are part of my life and kids that are part of my life. The 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 three couples that are the parents of those those kids are all white couples. Um, um, both both the both part both the individuals in those partnerships are white, and I think about uh, the challenges that white parents um, face um, with raising children of color and how do they make sure they can have the conversations that are important for those kids to have and um so what are the what are some of the the, the suggestions you make to to parents as they're well one just in general as they're having these conversations around racial identity and then uh, when there's different lived experiences between the parent and the child how do you help parents navigate those conversations um oh yeah again that's a wonderful question very wonderful questions i think first and foremost is First, tapping into your own understanding understandings about um, identity and race, especially if it's in the context of we're talking about racial um, racial differences. So, kind of checking with your biases, right? Also, checking to see what your friend groups are like, right? What your social networks are like, um, and also not being afraid to have the conversation. Because I think in many instances, right, certain um, certain generations of parents were raised that um, to take a colorblind approach to having the conversations about race. It's like, oh, I don't see color, so I'm not racist. But unfortunately, right, if you don't, if you don't see color, and that goes for any kind of, I think, I, intersection of ide identity, right? If you don't acknowledge who I say I am or who I show up as, you don't see me, then you don't value me, right? So, and to a certain degree, right? So, you you do see colors. I mean, if you're going to tell your kids there's a there's a blue flower, a yellow flower, and you say you don't see color, I mean, there's a there's a dissonance there, right? So we're already kind of setting our kids up. And the other thing too is learning about racial development, right? Parents having an understanding about racial development. Kids very much very early before the age of six months can see differences in 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 race, right? Differences in skin colors. Not that they, not that they have any kind, they assign any bias to that, but they already are seeing differences. They, you know, they see someone has, you know, lighter color skin or darker color skin, and that's fine. But then as we get older, if we don't talk about these things, right, we know that kids from what they see in the community, what parents are not saying, they're starting to internalize this idea of why someone's treated differently because of the color of their skin. You know, just like with gender roles, right? I mean, with, if if a if a young young man young boy says to a parent, "Oh, I want to play with a doll," and he's he's told not to play with the doll, right? You need the I'm going to give you the truck. And the little girl says, "Oh, I want to be a police officer or fire fire person or be a race car driver." And then a parent doesn't maybe they, maybe doesn't necessarily say something, but says, "Oh, why don't you play with this lovely doll with a pink dress?" Okay, so 
understanding like the choices we make as parents, right? Okay, like all these things come into play, right? Our social networks, our biases, um, and then also being comfortable talking about these issues, right? Um, knowing who you're, you know, what schools you send your kids to, right? What do the what's the what's the cultural makeup, racial makeup of the schools? And in some instances, right, you make the best choices you can as a parent, right? You want your kids to do well. We know that, you know, so all these things come into play. Um, so some practical, some practical skills, like I recommend to parents, um, especially with young children, make sure that you can, you know, one thing you can do is diversify your bookshelves, right? Making sure that you have books that are not only historical books about um, your child, right? Their, their racial or ethnic background, but also books that feature um, astronauts, um, dance, I mean, a variety of books that feature those children as the the cover art, right? And they're not just side characters, okay? And even if you're, you know, you have friends who have um, children or are or, or having new children, right? You know, having newborn, right? You can give, give them books, right? Diverse books. Um, the other thing too is leaning to the culture of, um, especially if there's a, a difference in the racial, um, the races between the parents and the child or cultural experiences, leaning into learning more about the culture um, of, of your child and vice versa. And then making sure that you, you know, you talk about everybody's identity, right? Like, you know, if mom um, is from England, okay, like, okay, what's that experience, right? A grandfather might be from Trinidad, okay. What are those experiences, again, those lived experiences and culture, food, um, going to museums, looking at the artwork, the books, immersing yourself, and then just being open to having the conversations. And really the baseline conversations are kindness, compassion, and empathy, right? So how do you want to mirror that for your children? You do that based on how you act with other people and conversations that you have. And again, very young, I mean, parents may not want to start very early having conversations directly about, oh, you experienced racism, but you'll see it, right? A child may come home a little bit sadder from preschool and you ask, what happened today? And then again, that opens up the conversation. You're listening, leaning in and having them sort of kind of lead the conversation. Um, so so those, are some, those are some recommendations. There's a lot of recommendations, but um, I can refer um, parents to some resources, healthychildren.org, um, which is an American Academy of Pediatrics um, website for parents. Myself and um, a few of my co-authors, um, Dr. Shanta Anderson, Dr. Nia Hergaris, and Dr. Monique Jindal, we've written several um, articles about ha having parents talk about racial bias with children, how to use books um, to talk about um, race, race and racial bias as well. Thank you for all the tips and resources, and we'll be sure to share those all with our community as well. So thank you so much. Um, what were those three words you mentioned? Was it caring, kindness, and empathy? Is that right? Yeah. So say more about how how that plays out in the conversation with, you know, because one thing I've learned about the words, and I'm sure many of us have, is we define them differently, and we also define sort of what those actions look like differently. Can you bring those and illuminate, illuminate those a little bit more for us in these conversations with kids? Yeah, so I think, you know, children very young understand the concepts of fairness, okay? So, you know, someone takes a toy from them, or a child is given um, more French fry, you know, okay, you know, something that they like than another kid, right? It's like, they're going to immediately say, you know, that's not fair. They got more than I did. And why do they, why did, why did she get that? Why did he get that? Right. So they understand that. And so this idea of like starting with like basic concepts that they already, already know, right. They love their mom. They love their dad. <coughs> they have friends, right. It's like, so starting with those basic concepts, so this idea of kindness is like ultimately, right? How do you want, you know, how do you how do you want others to treat you, right? If you if that's not fair, what's fair, right? So again, that that basic question: if a child has something that they that they've called out as unfair, um, and you ask, them, okay, so you know that's why do you think that's unfair? All right, and then they give you an answer: well, because you always give such and such to somebody, right? It's like, okay, so, you know, 
you know, do you understand, do you know why I gave more or made these choices? And then, you know, these conversations and then the conversation, you know what, remember last, remember when we went to the park last week and you got a chance to swing on the swing, you know, more than, than so-and-so, right? You know, so there are times when things might be different, right? But then there are other times where, you know, we can share. So again, having those basic conversations and then kind of slowly inter entering into further conversations, more in-depth conversations about, you know, how, how can we be kind to others, right? You watch something on television, they're watching Paw Patrol or something, right? These are like very small kids. And then you bring up the question, oh, you know, that's, I don't know all the Paw Patrols. I should probably know them by now. All the kids love Paw Patrol. And, you know, but again, it's just an example. It's like, oh, right, you know, that particular character, you know, what did they do, right? You know, that that was very nice. What, do you think that was nice too? Mm. And why do you think that's nice, right? We, you know, we call that kindness, right? We, you know, when we help someone that needs help, right? And we're not doing it for a selfish reason, right? We're, we're being kind, right? Or if a character or even a friend, like something happened, like a friend, um, you know, brother is in the hospital, right? You know, well, we're gonna we're going to write a letter to them, right, to make them feel better. That's compassion, right? We're showing that we care for other people. So again, kind of using experiences, and 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 in many instances, I like to use sometimes. I recommend using media, many instances, right, to help have, have these conversations or be sort of the launch pads for having conversations with kids. And I think if we definitely start early, they they know, right? They really know if we explain ourselves well to them and even model for them, right? Because our kids will even call us out sometimes. It's like, oh, you told me that, that I should share, but you didn't share, mom. Why didn't you share? You know, so, and then being open to those conversations and, and listening to them and having you know, kind of like a back and forth conversation. So hopefully that answers the question. It does, it does. Well, and, and you know, and I, I think part of it, um, uh, there's two things that are coming up for me. One is something you mentioned earlier, which I'll say in slightly a different in a slightly different way, which is so many of us of of my generation in particular were taught not to see color, uh, to say we're going to treat everyone the same and we're not, we're not going to see color and have you know certainly I've learned that that is that is not the the way what what's actually the the best answer. It can actually be harmful. And, and, and certainly in an unintentional way, but it can be harmful. And the reality is if we can't acknowledge that we see color, then we can't uh, connect the the rest of what that story might be for that, that person's experience. Um, and I think the other part of it is um, uh, that I'm hearing is, uh, you know, the, uh, and something that we talk about in the work that at Hummingbird that we do with, with our clients is we have to have these conversations. Like we were, again, so many of us were taught, like, we're not going to talk about race. We're not going to talk about sexual orientation. We're not going to talk about whatever makes us uncomfortable. Well, that means we're not having the conversation about what it means to be a real human and a full human and everything that comes with us as unique individuals. And it's okay to have those conversations. And um, I think that the the balancing act that when I think about those two realities is, you know, like we should acknowledge and the things that we see and understand and we should have conversations about them is, I know that the, some of the language I've seen emerge recently in this, com this the, the sort of social context around having these conversations with kids is how do you have them in an age appropriate way? Um, and sort of where do you start to enter, you know, introduce those, the concepts or the complexities or the, the realities, or maybe even some of the horrors of what systemic oppression actually, um, uh, how that how that plays out in the world around us. So how do, what, what advice do you give to parents as they're thinking about how to do it, how to have these conversations in age appropriate ways? I think, you know, definitely as a parent, understanding what media are you watching and listening to, right? Because if your child is in the room, they're going to hear what's on the news, right? And then they're probably, they're listening to it in the background. Mm. But I usually, I usually try to, you know, think about like what media are you watching and listening to? How are you responding to that media that you're listening to, right? Um, and again, I think a lot of it is, Everything is contextual for kids, right? They're, they're seeing and hearing everything, even though you might not <laughs> be aware of what they're seeing and hearing, right? And even what you're not seeing, what you're not doing, they're observing, right? They're, they're observing your patterns. And they're also observing other people that you put in their, in their sphere, right? Their sphere of influence, their networks, all right? If one parent, it's okay for that, for that child to say something and no one says anything that to refute that, it's like, you know what? 
That's not the best way to say that, right? They're, they're also experiencing that. So again, who your social networks are, who are your kids working? So it's very, it's very kind of subliminal at first, right? And then also to what books and the things that you are exposing them to that you are allowing them to, right? If you're letting them, are you letting them watch Sesame Street? Are they always on YouTube by themselves? Or, you know, because again, if you give them, and also too, are you giving them um, um, media early, like phones and iPads, you know, and are you censoring some things, right? Like, can they, if they're on YouTube, they're going to be pop-ups, you know, they're, they're also, they're also very savvy. They can, they can, they can change channels. They can, they know your passwords, that sort of thing. So, but I, but you know, so kids are growing up with this, but again, kind of understanding what their world is like. And then I think in having these conversations, you, again, definitely age appropriate. A two-year-old, you're probably not going to talk about, um, you know, George Floyd, right? But let's say a five-year-old, because you're watching the news, it's going to come up. And then your child may ask, mommy, why, you know, why do we, why, what happened to him? Okay. And then having to, you know, really have that conversation about, well, you know, we talk, we've talked about fairness before, right? We've talked about people being kind to others, sometimes that doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes, you know, there are situations where someone gets hurt because of how they look. And, you know, the, and the people that we count on to protect us, they're not all bad, but, you know, sometimes things happen and someone gets hurt, right, because of unkindness or unfairness. All right. And then you kind of keep it at that. And as they get older, right, the conversations are going to get deeper. Like, why is it unfair? You know, and sometimes as a parent, you may not have an answer for that. And it's okay. I don't know. I don't know why it's unfair. I, it hurts my heart that, that this happens, right? That this is unfair. And I want the world to be better for you. And I want to try to make sure that the world's better for you. But there, what, th what things can we do, right? You know, how do you think we can make the world better? How do you think we can, you know, feel better about this, you know, so, and then those are opportunities, right, to, to maybe engage in some activism, right, you know, can a, can the kid write a letter to the family, like, oh, I really feel bad, but I want to, I want to do something with my church, I want to do something at my school, you know, to make sure that other people aren't treated, treated this way, so again, so kind of starting very young, answering questions age appropriately, and not necessarily giving them more information that they're, than they're ready for, right? Letting them, letting them, it's like a dance, letting them lead the conversation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's going to really be listening. They're going to say something. And then, you know what, just right before you're about to like go into some deep explanation, oh, can we go to the movies or get ice cream? And that's like, okay. But at least you're, at least you're, at least they know that you're open to have the conversation and you're not shying mm -hmm. away from it. Sure, sure. Well, and I, what I, I love here is that there are, um, well, well, how it plays out might be slightly different, of course. The, there's certainly parallels to the way that this work plays out with adults as it does with kids, which is, you know, let people find their way through it and meet them where they are, um, which, is, which is the language we use in corporate environments is we want to meet individuals or groups of individuals where they are on their journey. Um, so we can start with foundational concepts, or if you've done some work already and you're ready for more of these more challenging concepts and you want to do that work that we could do that as well so like meeting you where they are and letting the being guided by the other person in the room and that sounds like it works with kids as well yeah but i think but it's also i think possibly the bridge and parallel between between these conversations either with younger people or even older people was that again whomever is in the in the control per se, like whoever has the power, the power dynamic, right? So a parent versus child or a corporation and employees, right? That you want to do the work and you're invested in doing the work, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have the conversation, but you know, again, it's really about from a parent perspective, challenging your own assumptions, your own beliefs, so that you can you can kind of, be, you can be open or, and, and to want to do the work, right? You've got to read the books. You've got to join groups. You've got to make sure that you're and even open, providing space for, for the conversation and for people that 
you're having the conversation about with the situations. So in that in that way, right? So it's not just sort of surfaced. Okay, you know, I could check off a box. I've done this. I'm done. That's all I need to do, right? It's got to go a little bit deeper to grow, right? To you're starting, you're creating a foundation, but then hopefully building more. Yeah, that, and that really resonates. And and uh, you know, I can I'm certainly aware of when we are uh, working with a leadership team. I'm, you know, it's it's very clear the, the leaders in the room who are doing the work and those who aren't doing the work. Um, and those that aren't doing the work, it affects not only their ability to lead in this in current environment, but if they happen to be parents, it would affect how they're able to parent and how they're able to have those conversations with the young people they're responsible for. So um, so that doing the work is is important. And it's not always easy or comfortable. I, you know, I've, I, I'm still doing the work. It's an ongoing process. And and some days I'm like, oh, I love what I learned today. And some days I'm like, that feels icky. And I wish that I, I wish that I hadn't done what I had done 10 years ago, but I know better now. And I, I, I won't do that again, whatever that may be. And that's part of that, part of that journey. How, you know, so it's clear that you've done some work or a lot of work um, on, on, and how to, you know, how to have an understanding of these, these conversations, how to be part of the change. How does it impact um, and I think, you know, one thing I would just want to acknowledge as I say that out loud is so many times when I say, when we talk about doing the work, often we think about it's only white people that need to do the work. All of us need to do the work. Um, it, it may play the, the, the journey that we're going on might look different based on our lived experiences, but that's all of us need to do work to understand, um, the world that we live in and how we can treat each other with respect and in better ways and how we can impact change. How does, how does the work you've done, uh, impact that your work as a pediatrician? Oh, I think most definitely it has. I think one, because the conversations that I had when I was younger right, with my pediatrician are def definitely different than the conversations I have now as a pediatrician and even different from my training, right? This idea of how do we talk to kids about um, sexuality, sexual orientation, um, racial identity, ethnic identity, language. Those necessarily weren't, I mean, part of the conversations in my pediatric residency program, but they're definitely in the forefront now, right? Because again, it's like when we talk about who a person is, a person doesn't just show up with um, an ear infection, right? Like, like you might have, I might have a kid that comes in who might have an ear pain, and then you notice how their demeanor, right? They seem a little bit, you know, kind of withdrawn. And then you get a little bit more information and it's like, okay, there's something else going on beyond that ear infection. So it's not, it's not just, you know, it's not just I'm treating a, treating a, giving a prescription, right? I have to, I have to understand the context in which that person comes to me. Sometimes it is just an ear infection and everything is going well, but in many instances, especially given COVID and, and mm -hmm. it's not just that, right? So having an understanding and a willingness to listen and learn first and then be open to ask questions and sometimes you know it's a, they're harder questions because it's like all right i'm used to asking when where how as opposed to why and what happened to you as opposed to you know so yeah so it gets a little bit more nuanced but definitely that work and again continued work because i mean there there are issues that i don't have to deal with right i am a heterosexual female where right? i identify as she and her when i have patients who come in and they identify as possibly as transgender or, you know, again, a different culture or race uh, than, than I identify with. I mean, I have to, I have to, I have to be open to, you know what, I don't know everything and I may not speak a language that someone else is speaking. So how do I respect that patient? How do I respect that family's context and it, and who they are so that I can better, we can have this, this better relationship, right? So that the care that's provided is provided in a way that benefits the family and not again that power dynamic I mean there's a, there's a lot of stuff right that you have to learn um and it's important for us to be able to have um a, a relationship and not just a provider telling a patient what to do yeah and there's and there's often more to the to the story or the, the situation yeah. to understand yeah well and I and I um uh some of my colleagues that I know a few of them are here and will we'll know what I'm probably about to probably know what I'm about to share is 
you know, so si I'm a white cisgender man, uh, you see him pronouns, I um, am also gay, and I'm a person with a disability, one of those is that I'm HIV positive. Um, so early on, when I when I was first diagnosed as being HIV positive, I was told very clearly, you need to have a doctor who knows how to treat H HIV. Um, and so I've always been in those spaces. Um, and generally, those doctors also know how to treat gay men. Well, this past Sunday, I went to a clinic. Um, and uh, there were some things that like the tests that they were going to run. And I'm like, you're not running the right tests <laughs> uh, for me as a gay man or for me as an HIV positive person and I was a little confused for a minute and then I then I, the the um uh, the doc the clinician a nurse practitioner left the room and came back um and I said hey I think you're treating me as a heterosexual man and uh she's like you're right that's what my training is I'm like well I'm not <laughs> and so there's some things we need to do that are differently and there's also some tests we need to run differently that are because I'm HIV positive and she's like okay and she was great about the conversation um and I'm and I'm totally fine it wasn't it didn't feel bad for me in that moment I was just I was grateful that I was aware that what what was happening so I could advocate for myself and then I said hey what I really hope you'll do is get some training in education so you can treat others um, in the way that they should be treated, particularly individuals in the trans community who I know are too often dismissed in, in, in the, these healthcare environments. Um, so I, I hope that I was able to be an advocate and help help the next person in that situation. You know, what, what do you, when you think about that, you've done the work, you've said, hey, this is important for me. I want to be able to show up this way as a, as a, as a doctor and as a clinician and a caretaker for others. What, what do you see as the opportunity for the healthcare profession to be able to, to bridge those gaps and the divides that exist today? Oh, I think there's lots of opportunities. I think, um, fortunately, the training programs now, and I, especially, and I think it's driven a lot by younger, younger providers, right, um, are asking to be trained differently, right? Because they understand either through their lived experiences, right, or um, others, surrounding them that things have to change, right? So there's a there's this want to, to learn more and learn differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those opportunities are starting younger in the pipe, like earlier in the pipeline in terms of medical school um, education, right? And experiencing um, and exposing um, uh, trainees to this understanding of all these I ideas of, of like what makes up a person, right? And the context around the person, or we call it like, um, the social determinants of health. Um, so what things, factors such as, you know, where they live, um, policies, laws, you know, that make a difference for allowing people to make, having opportunities to make healthy choices versus not, right? And then also to um, funding for research, for more research, funding for um, more training and not just training, because I think what's happening as we're going through this evolution it's not just the training, there needs to be money to actually make the differences, right? So providers can be trained on cultural competency or cultural humility, but again, do you have interpreters for is your, is your staff? Are you, are you deliberately hiring staff that, that make up the, that look like the population that you're serving? So that's, that takes money, right? And also how the healthcare system reimburses or doesn't reimburse, right? For certain, um, for certain procedures or for certain um, changes that are needed. You know, many medical staff, right, they're not, they're underpaid and, and they've been overworked because of, you know, we've, know, we've seen from COVID, there's been an increased number of providers in the education system, medical system that are leaving because they've been overworked, right, and not really um, appreciated. But then, but again, it's the systems that they're one, they're individuals, but also the choices that are made by the system. So there needs to be systems changes. So I think there are lots of opportunities um, for changes and then also making it easier for people to um, incorporate it into the training. If it started early, then you know it's normal, right? You sort of normalize um, these discussions. You know, people in my generation, we're learning and there definitely is more, more things we need to learn. Um, but it, well, not everyone's going to, you know, you got to meet, like you said, meet people where they are. But, you know, for those of us who are willing to do the work, we're here to do the work so that we um, make it more equitable. And we also uh, host hope on our way to justice, right? So that this uh, people are treated, treated um, 
treated fairly and treated justly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and I, you you may have seen the same pop up I saw with Lori. Lori liked your phrase "cultural humility," which I I love as well. And you know, and I and I kind of think um, you know, one of the reflections I had after my experience on Sunday. Um, and I'm I'm fortunate that you know the the clinician I was working with was very receptive and we had a great conversation and she immediately said, came she went she left and said I emailed my supervisor and said we need to do some training so she wanted to be part of the change um, and you know one of the thing I one of the things that I reflected on since then is. I don't expect any human to know all the things. Like it's not possible. I can't know all the things. I, I have to allow that for myself and I could expect that for a clinician as well. But even just the the humility, the awareness that, hey, there might be other things that I need to understand about this person's unique needs um, and uh, be open to asking those questions or engaging in the conversation, which is what my experience was on Sunday in many ways. Um, but that, that's a different skill set than I've learned this and I'm going to apply it. Correct, correct. Yeah. Um, but but again, I think hopefully that once we also provide individuals with an understanding of why it is they need to do it, right? I mean, because otherwise, I mean, even if even if it's about or you want your patient to be healthy, right? And and that if that's like if that's what the what the bomb the, the common understanding, okay, like what's what's the ultimate goal? You want your patient to take their medication. So then how are you going to do that? Are you going to get them, is the approach that you're taking, getting them to do what you want them to do, or what you think is, is the better option for them or give them the better health outcomes? If not, then you know what? You got to try something different, right? I mean, at some point, I mean, to me, it's just, it comes down to common sense. So, okay, I got to do something different and what's going to work. I mean, and it may be, like you said, a lot of things that we do that are, we aren't accustomed to, it's uncomfortable. But, you know, my job is to make sure you're healthy and I can't do that if I can't, if I don't change what I'm doing or not understanding your context, right? I'm like, okay, yeah, I want you to, again, like for doctors, we tell patients, oh, you know, we need to exercise, you need to eat healthy foods. But again, if, I, if, if you're not in a place where one, you have a safe place to play, you have, at, you know, you're living in a food desert, like, Come on, like okay. Then how can how can we work together? Tell me how, how you know what would you like to do? What can you do? You know, so it's really that conversation, and it's a it's really a relationship. If not, then it's like you know I can just tell you what to do, and that's not how it works. Even with children, ideally, right? It's like you can you're going to provide that structure, but ultimately, you know, you can't just bark orders and think that your child's going to just do what you want them to do, right? So. You have to have conversations and yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I have uh I I am uh exploring, let's just use that word because it's probably the right word, the the path were a path towards adoption. And so I've actually started to and so part of it's because of these young humans that are in my life and that I get to spend time with and um and I want to show up to and you know. Uncle Brian or whatever, or, or Mr. Brian, whatever they call me, but I want to be the a grown up that sh that sees them and can show up for them in the right way. And also, as I if I'm going to be a parent, I want to learn stuff. So I've, I've started to follow some really wonderful individuals and, and I'm learning about how to have some of these conversations with kids. Um, and it's really interesting. And of course, a, a lot of times it applies to adults, too. So uh, so it's always good learning. So I want to highlight a couple of things. So uh, learning, you have a, I, 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 I don't have a copy of Learning to Love All of Me, which I would hold up right now. Oh, look, thank you so much for helping. Um, so where can people find this book and, um, and who, who's the right audience? If you, is there an age range that this age, age range that this book is right for? Yeah, so it's a middle grade book. So kids nine to 12, ideally, um, to read the book. And anyone who just loves a good story, I mean, it's a friendship story, it's about family. Yes, there are underlying issues of racial identity and discovering who you are, but I think that's with all, you know, there's all this idea of discovering who you are, you wanna be, it's always that journey for being a middle schooler. Um, and it can be found on my website at whatisblack.co or Amazon. Awesome. So um, what is black.co is the website. Fantastic. And then um, I know you have a podcast that's also called what is black. What would what can people hear and our parents, I think it's targeted for parents. What, what are the, the, the conversations you have on that podcast that would be for people who might want to tune in? Sure. So we have conversations that um, 
directly impact how, how we can help um, black children grow to be healthy and thriving. Um, so we talk about, um, we talk about books, um, we talk about education, we talk about the justice system, we really talk about issues that really have underlying impacts for how um, children can grow up healthy. Awesome. I love it. I love it. And I realized I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. I, I, I forgot two of my talking points on this on Hummingbird Hour today. So at the very beginning, I forgot to mention that we have closed captioning. Um, so hopefully everyone who wanted to use closed captioning knows it's there. And of course, when we do the replay, we post it with the closed captioning for anyone who wants to, to follow along and, and be part of the conversation and, and use that tool. And the other one is if you have a question for Dr. Jackie, we do have a few minutes left and I'll, I can dive into a question with her. If you, if you have a question, throw it in the chat chat. Um, but I am definitely going to be sharing your podcast and I'm going to buy that copy of that book for some of the kids in my life. Um, and I want to get a copy for myself because even though it's for kids nine to 12, it sounds like I love a good story. So I'll check it out myself. Um, so we do have one question. Parents of children of color know about the talk to have with their kids as they start to experience racism. Uh, white parents are usually surprised that these talks take place because they don't have to discuss them. How can those parents approach a talk about allyship to the problems that children of color are experiencing? And, you know, I, I love this question. Thank you, JD, who's part of the Hummingbird team. And it's actually, um, I mean, I, I've actually, um, some of these friends that I've mentioned, I've actually said to each of them, are you having that talk with your kids? Like, I'm not an expert on it, but I just know you have to have the talk in some way because I want to make sure that we're raising humans that are ready for the real world. So I think first and foremost, being willing to have those conversations um, and knowing that it might be an awkward conversation and you know if you need to do some research ask a friend um like a trusted friend or even just you know google like how to have the conversation why it's important to have the conversation and i think you know, especially if it's i guess it's, i'd say parents either who are white parents who have children of color or white parents who have children that are that identify as white should still have the conversation right because it's really about um context it's about like you said being being fair right what's fair in this world what's not fair and why why people are treated differently than other people and then acknowledging that that's that that's the case right and then if necessary you know we go back to history um you you we use history as context for why we have the conditions that we have now um and this unfairness and treat people are treated differently and in terms of allyship right i think it's really about um speaking up when something is wrong, right? And but doing it in a safe, safe way, right? Is there an adult, a teacher that you can talk to if you saw someone get bullied, right? Or if you feel like because for some people they may not feel safe, right? And it's okay if you don't feel safe if someone's, you know, especially if it's a physical altercation. But if there's some way, you know, you can talk to that friend afterwards, oh, I'm so sad, I'm so sorry that that happened to you, right? And I wish I, you know, you're learning to do better, talking to parents about it. You know, my friend got, you know, got harassed in school or bullied in school because of the color of her hair, because of the color of her skin or his skin or where he's from or because his lunch was different than everyone else's lunch, right? And then a parent, you know, being willing to support that. And I think you're right. I mean, I think I love the fact that you told me that, right? And again, it's like it, the talk is not a one talk, right? I know from my own personal experience with my kids, right? It's not a one and done talk. It's a, it's an evolving talk and it's also an understanding of um not so much putting being fear-based but like you said trying to set like this unfortunately this is what happens i want you to stay safe but also too i want you to also protect your friends as well right and stand up for them again going back to either talking to someone talking to come talking to me if you feel like you don't know how, have the right words and i'll go to the school with you and we'll we'll help that friend and i could or i could call that parent well, my my son my, my son told me about what happened in school today how can i help how can i support right so and just being in a position to listen and just be open to have continued conversations and asking questions and being curious with that ted lasso be curious not judgment <laughs> oh you're on mute brian oh i was thank you so 
<laughs> be curious, not judgmental. Thank you for the, for uh, some, the, I think Lindsay said, Brian, you got to unmute as well. So thank you both for keeping me on track. Um, I have a, I don't know what's happening outside. There's just a machine. I, I it's a, either a weed eater or a, a leaf blower or a chain. Something's happening though. So um, the, uh, I think curiosity is important. You offered so many great tips there and suggestions, uh, which I, which I really appreciate. The one though, that I really want to make sure that I double down on and say is I really appreciate you reframing to say the convert, those conversations need to happen with all kids, regardless of their color or their gender or so on. Because um, too often we can, I think, raise white kids that are off the hook for have, being part of this conversation and they need to be part of the conversation and part of the change as well. So thank you for, 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 for that important reminder and message. Um, so I know we're at time. Any just final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to leave our, our, our group with? Oh. I just thank you so much for having this platform to have these conversations. Um, and I'm very much honored to be here today. And, you know, always, you know, plug by the book, um, you know, and I love, I love looking forward to connecting with people, you know, social media. I'm at what is black um, or Dr. Jackie Duje on Instagram. So look forward to continue the conversations. And then I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So. Excellent. So, and we will be sure that when we will send out a, an email and share all those links um, with everyone in our community. Um, so thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Jackie. It was such a pleasure. I learned um, some things as I knew I would. Um, and uh, I look forward to some future conversations. I think we we got to make the Dr. Ophelia Byers and the Dr. Jacqueline Duje conversation happen. So uh, Lindsay, let's take a note. Let's make it happen. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. Everyone that's watching um, with us today live or uh, the recording later. Thank you so much for being part of the Hummingbird community. Um, as always, we look forward to hearing from you and connect with Dr. Jackie on LinkedIn and check out her website, whatisblack.co. Um, Is that whatisblack.co? Yep, got it. I, I wanted to make sure I remember that correctly. Um, and uh, until next time, stay safe and be well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.